In the first video on correlation we saw that this expression up here could be used to determine how similar two signals were. And we found that the technique worked very well when we were dealing with signals that had roughly the same energy, like these signals X and Y here. Uh, but the technique broke down when we were introduced signals that had different amplitude values and therefore different energy levels. So the example we used was this signal Z, in which the first sample is relatively large, a value of 100, and the overall energy of this signal is much larger than the other two. And we found that when we compared signals of different energy levels that our results were skewed a bit. So for example, when we compared the signals X and Y using this uh, technique up in the corner, we found that we got this numerical value of 25. Uh, whereas when we compared Z and Y, we get this larger numerical value of 187, which isn't really what you'd expect. In general, what you expect from correlation uh, results is that a larger value indicates more similarity. Now, the solution to this problem is to scale um, this correlation function by some factor that is determined by the energy of the signals that you're analyzing. And the expression that you can use is this one here, which is, um, just let me bring it up, it's referred to as a normalized correlation function. And you can see that the normalized correlation function is, um, well, it's, the numerator term is the same as the standard correlation function. So if we compare this with this, they are the same. Um, the denominator term is the new part, okay? And basically what this denominator term is doing, it's scaling the overall result of your correlation by uh, a factor that is related to the energy in the two signals that you're looking at. So the denominator is made up of this summation of x squared n, which is a measure of the energy in the signal x, and this summation of y squared n, which is a measure of the energy in y. Now we take the square root of the product of those two energies uh, to give us an overall scaling factor. But it's important to note that basically this normalized correlation function is this result divided by a uh, scaling factor which is related to the energy that's contained in the signals that you are uh, measuring the similarity of. Um, so let's just show you that in action then. Um, and uh, just to do the calculations, we've, we've already calculated the numerator part of the cor normalized correlation function earlier on. Okay, So we just now need to calculate the denominator part. And I have done that. Um, here we go. So the denominator is the square root of the energy in the signal x uh, multiplied by the energy in the signal y. So to calculate the energy in the signal x, it'll be the sum of the squares of the individual samples. So that's going to be 1 plus 9 plus 4 plus 16. So we can see that over here, 1 plus 9 plus 4 plus 16. And for the y terms, it's going to be the square of each individual sample. So that'll be 4 plus 9 plus 1 plus 9. So we can see that here, 4 plus 9 plus 1 plus 9. And when we sum those and multiply them and take the square root, we get this result of 26.27. And then finally, what we need to do is take our uh, standard correlation result, if you'd like to call it that, and divide it by the denominator value to give us an overall result of, of 0 0.95. And we can do the same then with uh, the comparison between y and z. Um, and I've done that out as well. Um, you can go through the calculations yourself, but essentially I've got my denominator term, and I've taken my result of my standard correlation and divided by my um, by my measure of the energy in both signals to give me this final result of 0 0.38. And now, these m results are in keeping what you would expect to find from correlation. The larger the value, the more similar the two signals are. So we saw that Z and Y are less similar than Y and X, and now these numerical results that we're getting back fall into line with those expectations. Um, now, it is also important to note that there is a, a, a minimum and maximum value you can get from your normalized correlation result, and the maximum that you could possibly get is a value of 1, whereas the minimum possible 
normalized correlation result will be um, minus one. So your normalized correlation measurement will always lie within that range. Um, now you will get a value of one if you were to compare x with itself. So uh, if you were taking the normalized correlation of x comma x, you would get a value of one. You would get a value of minus one or negative one if you were to take uh, the correlation of x with uh, an inverted uh, version of itself. And by that I mean just multiplying x by minus 1. So let's create a new vector b, which will be the uh, inverted value of x, which would be minus 1, minus 3, 2, and minus 4. If we were cor to correlate b with x, we would get a value of minus 1. And you should do those calculations yourself um, just to, to verify. But knowing this, knowing that the, the upper uh, and lower possible values lie within a certain range, so between 1 and minus 1, can be very useful. It means that the results of your normalized correlation uh, can be uh, analyzed more easily because with the standard correlation technique you need to have some knowledge of the, the energy in the signal before really interpreting the results whereas normalized correlation can sometimes be easier to interpret. Now this might mean that or at least when people see this first of all they start to think that well why would you ever use the standard correlation approach rather than the normalized correlation result uh, or the normalized correlation approach and um, there is a reason why and I, I'd like to just illustrate a, a reason why you might not use normalized correlation by taking a look at some MATLAB code so I'll just run through that now so this is the script I'd like to run through and basically what I've done is I've created three sinusoids here and the sinusoids are all of different frequencies. You've got a 1 hertz sinusoid, a 4 hertz sinusoid, a 10 hertz sinusoid and what I've done down here is I'm creating two signals A and B and these signals A and B are basically made up of the sinusoids that I've created up here and we can see that the signal S1 is uh, multiplied by 2 in A and it's only multiplied by 1 in B. So it's uh, twice as strongly present in the signal A as it is in B. And what I'd like to show you now is how the two correlation uh, techniques work when we're trying to identify how strongly present one signal is in another signal. So in this example, I'm going to try to find out how strongly present S1 is in both signals. Now we know the result already because we synthesized the signals, but if we didn't synthesize the signals, this, of course, same technique would work. Um, so let's just show you how this is done. Um, uh, down below here, what I'm doing is I'm correlating um, using the standard approach and this is an equation that implements the standard approach uh, it's the summation of A multiplied by uh, S1 and down here we have a normalized uh, a correlation approach which is implemented using this piece of code and effectively it's the same uh, as a, so we've got the standard correlation highlighted here divided by the square root of the sum of the uh, or, well the square root of the product of the energy in both signals and down below here we're doing the same except comparing it against signal B rather than signal A and when we, re we run the script we'll see the results and just going into the command window we can see that the first output gives us a core result of 1, sorry 100, whereas for the standard approach when we're comparing B with, uh, with S1 we get a result of 50. Now this is interesting because we can see that this standard correlation result gives us a, a value that is twice the amplitude or twice the, the magnitude of the correlation result when we compare B with uh, the signal S1 and if we go back to the script well that is the situation S1 is twice as strongly present in A as in B and the standard correlation result shows that or indicates that whereas if we compare the normalized correlation result we get no indication of how, of how strongly present one signal is in another signal so the reason why we went through that example is just to highlight that the two approaches have their place. 
sometimes you might want to use a normalized correlation approach other times you might want to use this more standard correlation result it really depends upon what it is you need to do okay so that's it uh, the next video will be on cross correlation and um, thanks for your attention